Hello, this is a short version of a talk that I gave recently at the Canada Geo Convention in May 2017. It's about a piece of research I embarked on uh, at least a couple of years ago, um, joined by Matteo Nicoli to recover data from scientific images um, and especially seismic images without knowing the color map, which might sound like a, a simple problem, but it turns out it's quite tricky. And in fact, it's so tricky that we haven't really solved it. <laughs> and I think we've made a bit of progress um, or, or got really close, maybe. Uh, I'm actually not convinced that we were barking up the right tree. But anyway, I wanted to share what we've done. Um, maybe you want to pick up the research. Maybe you've got some advice. I'd love to hear it uh, because I. I've been a little bit obsessed with this problem and I needed to present it and <laughs> just sort of to, partly to leave it behind for a bit because um, I think maybe it needs a completely different approach. Anyway, the, the, so the problem is recovering data from these images without knowing the color map. Let's, let's have a look at why that might be a difficult problem. Um, it sort of all started a, a few years ago. We did an unsession in Calgary, a sort of unconference, if you like, and we asked, what are the big unsolved problems? in exploration geoscience. And the top one, believe it or not, was about open data and kind of sharing more data. And so that started us thinking about, wow, there's a lot of data locked up in places like research papers, um, places like the Virtual Seismic Atlas, where there's seismic data. So it's almost like, oh, I've, oh if only I could interpret it. Um, but I can't because the, I, all I have is an image, right? Maybe a JPEG or a PDF. Of this uh, of this data, I can't you know load it up into Open Detect or Petrel or somewhere to actually go pick a horizon, say. So that's the kind of problem we're thinking about now with maps. Um, quite often, the, you know, we potentially have the same problem, but often I find they are published with a color bar or an information theory. It's often called a code book, or you might think of it as the color palette for the image. Um, so it's, it's hidden away in Africa over on the left here in this particular figure. But in principle, I could take that and with a bit of sort of cunning coding, I could uh, look up the images, sorry, look up the colors in the image and recover the data. Um, but like I say, that's often not the case with seismic. And, you know, you could say, well, I can see that it's a red, white, blue color map or something like that. And we could try and guess the color map that's been used. But, you know, there's a large, large number of color maps. Some of them are really gross. Um, and it's just I, I, almost for sort of aesthetic reasons, I'd love to be able to do it without a priori knowledge like that. So the sort of next step, if you like, uh, maybe I'll just hide. Well, I can move this uh, for a second. Um, the, the next step here was that I built this little bot called um, FreakBot or AgeoBot. You can go play with it yourself if you like, AgeoBot.ElasticBeanstalk.com. Um, and what what you, what happens there is you upload an image. Well, actually, you just give it the URL to a s image of some seismic data. You give it the the the, the region where the data resides, um, give it the timing. So in this case, like zero to three and a bit seconds. Um, and in return, you get a, a seismic data file. So a segwi file plus some inf information like the um, spectrum, the dominant frequency of the data, signal to noise ratio, that kind of thing. But you know, I wanted to be able to handle images that didn't have a color bar, or you didn't know the color bar, sorry, didn't use the grayscale color bar as well. Uh, and if possible, avoid having to provide the region. Clearly you, well, I guess unless you do some sort of OCR or whatever, you, you're going to need to know some, some information to get at things like the spectrum. You're going to need to know time. Um, but I, I wanted this to be a more general or handle more general cases. So um, to click there, I guess. So why, why can we recover grayscale images? Well, in a grayscale image, um, so I've got I've marked out two of the pixels here. This is like zoomed in on some pixels, if you can imagine. Uh, there's one with a value of five thousand. It's been translated into RGB values of forty, forty, forty. The minus three thousand has values of one eighty, one eighty, one eighty. You can see that all the channels, the red, green, blue channels, are the same, and there's a kind of linear mapping between the RGB values or any one of the RGB values and the amplitudes. So it's very easy for me to just turn this into data. I can sort of treat it literally, if you like. Color images don't work like that. I have 
uh, now a distant non-linear mapping. Um, the 5,000 now, you know, is represented by a pixel with RGB values of 52, 128, 185. There's no uh, easy way to turn that into amplitudes. And this is sort of um, perhaps brought home, I'm going to have to hide my, my face here for a sec. Um, when we look at the pixels plotted into RGB space, a 3D space, um, you can see that they are arranged in a kind of line curved around in that 3D space. That's what the color bar looks like. Um, now, what does the grayscale look like? Well, it's just a straight line, right? It's fairly intuitive. But it turns out there are other color bars uh, which aren't straight, but which I can treat as if they were grayscale color bars because the lightness, uh, the, the sort of value um, of the pixels, say the average value, uh, increases linearly um, uh, and monotonically with the with the data. Matteo wrote has written extensively on this. Uh, here's one of the references at the top of the page there um, on this sort of perceptual uh, monotonicity, if you like. Um, by drawing these graphs, for example, you can see the the lumpy graph of the spectrum color bar and the sort of nice monotonic ramp of a linear color bar. Um, this one's of his own devise, devising, but there's one called um, Viridis in Matplotlib that you can use, uh, which meets those same requirements. And if we cast those color bars, um, the, the Matplotlib color bars that I showed you before, into grayscale, you can see where the problem is, um, you, you just can't tell the difference, right, between different colors in the color bar. If we look at some seismic data, you know, here's a color on the left, black and white on the right. You can see that both ends of the color bar are dark gray. So I can't tell the difference between a peak and a trough. Now, I, I can still have a go at recovering the data. I've done that on the left here. And you can see that it looks fairly plausible until you look at one of the traces, which I've plotted horizontally at the bottom, the blue trace the leftmost trace in the data, um, you can see that it's just a bunch of spikes, right? It doesn't have the zero mean that we expect of seismic data. On the right, I've recovered the data with the hack that I'm just about to show you, and, and you can see the trace at the bottom does have a zero mean. Uh, it, well, it's not zero. It, it wiggles around um, a value of 64 because that's uh, how I've scaled this particular data set. Um, but the point is that it wiggles around and it's got peaks and troughs. So here's the recipe, the algorithm. Um, I've highlighted number th like step number three because it's the kind of original step in our uh, in our workflow. Um, and I've also provided the software on the right hand side in green uh, for any of you who are interested in trying to replicate this in Python. Our code is on GitHub if you want to go give it a run. Um, the link is at the top there. So we start off with some pre-processing. We reduce the number of colors in the image. We sort the colors in the image into order. So it become obvious what, well, hopefully, uh, what I mean by that in a minute. Uh, and then it's a fairly simple matter of just looking up the index of each pixel in the image and, and uh, treating that as the data range. And then finally, uh, as a sort of cherry on top, we can save a segwi file. So here's the pre-processing step, or just an example of it. This is a picture of a piece of seismic data on, on Matteo's wall. Uh, you can see it's got perspective in it. There's annotation and other issues. Well, his um, very nice bit of code identifies the data uh, block, as it were. Uh, it's, as, a, as I mentioned, it's got this perspective issue, but he can correct that and extract uh, the data and the, do this sort of ortho uh, rectification step and here's an image that I can uh, work with but for reasons that I'll explain later I'm, I'm going to use a different color map because uh, this one turns out to be <laughs> really difficult to work with um, so I'm going to go back to the, the blue white red color map and just as a reminder here it is plotted in uh, the pixels plotted in 3d space um, the RGB space and you can see the color bar this is the after the color reduction step, which is very simple to do in scikit-learn in uh, Python. Uh, so I've reduced the number of points there to 128 to simplify things a little bit. Now, the problem fundamentally is that these, so, I mean, it, it, I could stop there and go, oh, I've got my color bar. But the problem is that they're in random order. So I, there's no way for me to tell where I am along that color bar um, or along that the locus of points um, because 
uh, they're completely shuffled. Now, now my challenge now is to put them in order. And it turns out that you can treat a set of points like this as a graph. Uh, so in the sort of a graph theory jargon, um, it's just a network, basically. Now, this sort of um, exploit, if you like, was um, first described by William Rowan Hamilton or realized as he was playing with uh, sort of polyhedrons and realized that he could represent the vertices of a polyhedron on a, a, a on a graph, a flat graph. This and in this representation, he could think more clearly about the the geometry. And he actually invented a game that people would a sort of parlor game that people would play, where they would the challenge was to visit all of the vertices or the nodes of this graph um, once and once only uh, each, and return to the starting point and. I, I think in the middle of the 19th century, this was quite a popular game. And it, it sort of, as a result, this type of visiting uh, each node once and returning to the starting point is called a Hamiltonian um, of a given uh, graph. Uh, so that, that's what we want to find as a Hamiltonian. Now, it turns out this is very closely related to the traveling salesman problem, which you might have heard of, an NP hard problem, which means it's uh, very difficult to solve uh, in a reasonable amount of time. This particular illustration here is showing a brute force solution to a seven city traveling salesman problem. So the challenge here is to visit these hypothetical seven cities uh, once and once only, returning to the starting point, but with the shortest possible path. Okay, so um, the reason why I was attracted to trying to do this as a traveling salesman problem is there's lots of software out there for solving this type of thing and it's highly optimized because lots and lots of researchers have attempted it. Um, there are a couple of tricks that we need to use um, because we don't want to return to the starting point. We want a line with a start and an end point um, and uh, we also need, need to figure out where the start is because <laughs> Part of the problem with these being in random order is we don't even know where to start. So my heuristic for that is to say, well, it's the closest point to black or zero, zero, zero in the RGB graph or chart, sorry. Um, so I add that zero point uh, and say, whichever point is closest to that, start there. And then I add this sort of what I've called an everywhere point, uh, but it's a, a point that has zero distance to every other point. And this sort of tricks the solver into visiting it last uh, nine times out of ten and um, and giving me uh, when I remove that point giving me a start to end um, because, so I know which point to remove basically because I added it right so uh, we remove both of these points at the end so they don't affect the outcome they just control how the solver proceeds um, I found three traveling salesman problems, uh, sorry, uh, traveling salesman solvers, LKH, Concord, and Google's OR tools. These things are used these days extensively for route planning, for you know, self-driving cars and logistics and things. So like I say, they're highly optimized. I used this PyTSP library. Uh, I had to tweak it a bit. So if you want to copy my stuff, you're going to need to use my fork um, or, or solve the bugs yourself. Um, and uh, yeah, it kind of unintuitively, I think um, these solvers only require the interpoint distances, the, the the node distances. They don't need the actual positions of the nodes in sort of Euclidean space or in that RGB space. Um, so anyway, Sci SciPy has these very nice tools for manipulating um, n-dimensional point sets and the, the distances between them. So it's very straightforward two lines of code to um, generate the data I need for the solver. And it works beautifully. On the left there is the unordered uh, palette or code book. And on the right is what comes out of the TSP solver, basically all the points in order. And I've left my black point in there as the starting point just to illustrate how that uh, works. But I, I do, of course, remove that point. And like I say, it does work. So on the left there, um, is the original data with the with the color map. I, I generated this plot so I know exactly um, what the data is. And on the right there is the recovered data. Um, the histograms of the data sets are at the bottom there and you can see that they're comparable, but the 
color reduction step has um, clipped the data a little bit. The error is measurable because again, I know the I know the data set. I have the data, so I can measure the error directly. Um, and 0 0.32 out of kind of one might seem like quite a large error, but it's confined to the peaks and troughs. And uh, the RMS error is quite low at 0 0.07. So I feel like it's a decent solution. You know, it, you wouldn't. <laughs> it's not amplitude friendly, <laughs> let's say, but um, it's certainly interpretable. And it works on on these other data sets too. Like I can throw uh, more or less any kind of color map at it. Uh, here's a velocity field with a sort of rainbow type color bar. Um, it works really nicely. Of course, I wouldn't know the actual values of the velocities unless the author happened to mention them in the caption for the figure or whatever. Um, so, you know, that is potentially a problem. Um, here's a horrific color bar. <laughs> it really wiggles around in 3D space, as you can see. Please don't ever use color bars like this. But um, it works perfectly fine uh, on this color bar too. So, I've, you know, Keats wrote this poem uh, that mentions uh, unweaving a rainbow. Richard Dawkins, a uh, phrase which Richard Dawkins made famous um, in his writing. And But I like the phrase... So uh, we've, we've called the app implementation of this code Keats. Uh, so you can go to keats.gsi.ai um, to unweave your own rainbows. Th there's no user interface for this app. I'm sorry, it's just a web API. Um, here's an example of how you would pass some data to it to, uh, w to unweave its magic on. <laughs> uh, so this is in Python. It would be fairly straightforward to do it in another language too. Um, your, it, the, the app's hosted on... Amazon AWS um, and your result segue file or PNG or whatever gets uh, dropped into a, an S3 bucket where you can pick it up. There are some limitations, uh, definitely. Of course, I, I mentioned you don't get the magnitudes themselves back. You don't get the polarity. You don't can't tell the polarity uh, a priori. So you, you need to tell it that. And there's a keyword in the API to reverse it. Um, lossy compressed images like jpegs don't do well interpolated color maps so if the color map is interpolated in the plot which it very often is uh those that causes problems hill shading causes problems as i'll show you in a sec and um of course things like annotations i can't recover the data from underneath those here's a hill shaded um uh, image this is from mars uh, but, you know, fairly classic kind of implementation of hill shading um, causes huge problems, right? Because the, the color map gets kind of smeared down towards the black point. That's how the hill shading works. And you can see the pixels in the middle there. And on the right, of course, I mean, the, the traveling salesman solver can't make head or tail of, well, that's the reduced uh, 128 color version of the um, pixels. But, I mean, it's pretty pointless trying to recover data from that. Now, there are later on in this presentation, if you go visit it on the web, you can scroll through to some other uh, failure modes, but that's that's one. Yeah, th like I say, <laughs> this turned out to be really difficult. I, I tried lots and lots of things that I haven't shown you here. Um, you know, I tried uh, all sorts of clever linear regression techniques to get at the 3D color bar using an algorithm called Mars. Um, I tried to implement some collinearity constraints to stop it from weaving around so much. Uh, none of these things worked in a consistent way. So it works on images that I make, that I give it, and on a few very specifically made types of images from the literature and so on. Um, but on most real cases, it either falls over for certain parts of the color map or it doesn't work. Um, I have a hunch that deep learning might get somewhere with this problem uh, by generating a large number of training images with all sorts of color maps and training a neural net to uh, recover the data. But I mean, that is just a hunch and I'm not ready to work on that yet, but someday. The code for this thing is on GitHub. There's the link. The link for this presentation is at the bottom there. Um, I'd love to hear from you. There's my email address, matt at agilescientific.com. Please get in touch if you've got ideas, if you want to work on this, if you want the rest of my code, uh, whatever you need, um, just give me a shout. 
And with that, I can't see how to bring uh, my face back so I can say goodbye properly. But um, that's all I've got. Thanks a lot for listening. And uh, if you pick this up, good luck.